family, but I'm in middle management. Uh, the leadership of the company is depicted on these uh, plaques, pre-plaques, and we will be uh, gaily rewarded by one of the presidents uh, later on. How many people are here from Kenner? Would you raise your hands? Hoorah! Hoorah! One of the great things about Kenner is we felt that the company was more or less like a family. And rather than being too family oriented, I'd like uh, uh, my family to stand. My brother Rick, if you would please stand. My wife Ellen, if you would please stand. And our Back there. Yeah, right. <laughs> Believe it or not, there was a world before toys, and we're going to try to, in warp speed, let you see and hear just a little bit about what that world was. Vanna White was not with us, so we have brought my family with us. <laughs> Ricky Steiner is holding up one of the first products that the company ever produced, Tom Collins Jr. It's a tasty lemon drink that is literally available now, was initially distributed by Barks Root Beer, and can be found very limited on shelves throughout very small sections of Greater Cincinnati. <laughs> Next is Grandpa's Pine Tar Soap. Grandpa's Pine Tar Soap. Bear, bear in mind that this is the start of Kenner, and these are the real products that we're showing you today that were the start of Kenner. Grandpa's Pine Tar Soap did meet with some competition, a, a little soap company down the street. However, Grandpa's Pine Tar Soap can be found on Google and in sometimes at Cracker Barrel. R rounding out the category of product is Iron Bear, Iron Beer. Iron Beer was the second leading selling soft drink in Cuba in its day. <laughs> Needless to say, it has lost its ranking in Cuba. However, it's very popular in South Florida. And if my helpers will now put away those props, I would appreciate it. Put them in the bag if you would. And, um... Thank you. Uh, I am... Uh, my teleprompter is not here. Um, our video equipment and uh, the, the stations from across the country have just been rolling in, and I, I just haven't had time to establish everything. Major thanks goes, and major history goes, to why we are here today. And we is everybody in this gathering. The Cincinnati Public Library decided that for the holidays, it might be a good idea to have a toy, uh, a, a toy exhibit. And I would like Brian Powers to raise your hand and, and let everybody see. It's Brian Powers who enticed the library to have a toy exhibit. And that toy exhibit was from the people of Bang Zoom, which is Michael Hoding, and the collectors uh, as well, Dan Pilardo, Josh Bate, and they actually decorated and curated the Cincinnati room, and Brian indicated that in all of the exhibits that they have ever had, the Cincinnati room has never extended the hours except for this exhibit of these toys from those folks. Artswave, Tamara Harkavy, was present during the holidays and saw what was going on. And coincidentally, although the mayor may not remember this, he too was in the library and took a peek with his seven-year-old son and asked, what's next? What's behind us is what's next. And so much so, it is what's next. Six months later, after Tamara Harkavy 
made some suggestions and coerced and so forth. And she led an incredible arts work team. We touched base with the then retired chairman of Hasbro Toys, a third generation uh, member of the Hassenfeld family, Alan Hassenfeld. And he recognized the importance that Kenner had to Hasbro and to the city of Cincinnati and the role that art plays in our everyday lives. And it's with his support of the Hassenfeld Family Foundation that the project was off and running. Mr. Potato Head, that's prominently featured on this mural, is a tribute to the recognition that Alan Hassenfeld enjoyed. Incidentally, he would have been here today, but he was busy on some other major intercontinental conferences in Europe. Intercontinental, okay. <laughs> Kenner Toys were really a recognition of what we see in adult life brought to the world of toys. Our mayor did a phenomenal job of really saying some of the information that I was thinking about that needs not too much saying. Because on this mural, I think everyone can identify with various different parts of it. Kenner Products, in its early days, tried to adapt what we saw in adult life to kids. Television cartoons, how to bring cartoons into your own family and show your own cartoons, the Give a Show projector. The age of phonographs before television, how could we bring kids' phonographs into being? the clothes and play phonographs. Fascination with construction and building and people seeing all sorts of building going on. The girder and panel building sets. Mom's kitchen. What was going on in mom's kitchen that could possibly be transferred into the world of children? One, two, three. Easy bake oven. <laughs> By the way, that was unrehearsed. <laughs> For those of you ah, who made a mistake. Take it from the top. <laughs> My brother, who I knew was going to help me, asked me to take it from the top. And I want you all to pay very, very close attention. That is a tape recorder rewinding to the top. That was a very, very weak laugh. The Easy Bake Oven is 50 years old. A book has been written, written about the Easy Bake Oven and the history of the Easy Bake Oven. This is not a paid political announcement. In addition, for those of you who have an interest, and want to send in a postage paid uh, sealed envelope, not sealed envelope. The Kenner Toy Story from 1946 to the year 2000 would be sent to you gratis if you have the right way to pack it up and send it in. It features all the toys from that area, from the main toys to a collage of toys. And then in addition to that, it features all of the living uh, leaders of the company from 1946 to the year 2000. It's a fascinating uh, piece of work if you have an interest in that. Toy development. Internal generated ideas and internal uh, concepts were the heartblood of Kenner Toys. The toy industry focused on a lot of things that we just see normally, such as a swivel chair. Now what on earth would a swivel chair have to do with anything about toys? Well, Kenner's creativity found what it had to do. Just imagine taking that swivel chair, lowering it, and having probably the best stationary ride-on toy that the toy industry has ever seen, the sit and spin, created by Kenner's Clear Engineering. 
We also want to recognize a major feature that went on within the toy industry when Albert Steiner, one of the three brothers, was posthumously elected into the Toy Industry Hall of Fame. And his appearance represents the factor and influence that Kenner had in terms of the entire toy industry. And that plaque is on display as well. Jonathan Queen has captured the essence of kids' play in this marvelous mural that he's created. He's taken all of us back to our use, and the toys themselves are interacting on the wall with one another. And they reflect the ingenuity and the creativity of the interaction of kids' play. Sit back with us and remember our youth and remember what we had for such a long period of time. Kenner was vaulted into the big leagues with television programs like The Six Million Dollar Man and the toy rendition of that incredible show. Following the success of The Six Million Dollar Man, the company reached the top of the toy industry when a movie property came along that many, many others had passed up. The line in the movie was called... Star Wars. And you'll hear more about that later. Kenner's success focused on three simple words. They all began with P. People, product, and profit. And the most important ingredient were our people. I'm not gonna single out anybody here, but just again, welcome to all of our Kenner family. Kenner's humble beginnings moving from Cincinnati's own Kenner Street to the big leagues on Wall Street, and along the way, a family company, to a division of a Fortune 500 company, to a publicly traded standalone company, to a toy construction company, and eventually to a former family health company in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. The mural that you see is clearly a tribute to Kenner and our place in the United States toy industry, and of course, in Cincinnati's history. But make no mistake, this is and was our company and is a tribute in the form of this fabulous mural and is a testament to all of us, as you will see from the plaques that are yet to be fully developed that complete a tribute to the Kenner leadership whom most, with whom most of us work. It's with a great deal of pleasure. It's I told you we rehearsed this. <laughs> it's with a great deal of pleasure that I introduce you to one of Kenner's leaders and to whom we are proud to say became one of the top executives in the Hasbro family and one of the top ranking women in the entire toy industry, Ginger Kent. Thanks, Perky. Now, I want to tell everybody that Perky told me I had three to four minutes. Little did I know he had 25. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you, Perky. I've always felt that we all shared this great privilege to have worked at Kenner. And we should thank Corky, his family, and also Alan Hassenfeld and the Hassenfeld Family Foundation for their generous contribution towards making this mural a reality. It is actually, it's truly an honor being asked to speak today. And frankly, also a little embarrassing because one of the core characteristics of Kenner was teamwork. And that culture was also one of the important ways it distinguished itself later as a division of Hasbro. So I may get to speak today, but I was just one person among a much larger team, and it took everyone in every department pulling together to make the great products represented behind me today. So let me share a few stories, some reflections, I guess, as I think about my years at Kenner Hasbro. Two sayings come to mind, and for those who are on the scene, they ought to be familiar. One was, you don't have to be crazy to work here, but it helps. <laughs> now that really spoke to the creativity of the place, and that creativity existed everywhere in the organization, not just in the areas you'd expect, like product design and development, but in all areas. Everyone applied creativity to their job. It could be, and was, the engineer who figured out a way to redesign the shooty bits for action figures, 
thereby saving us or rather gaining us significant profit improvements, or the packaging designer who gave us a look on shelf that nobody else had met, had and maximized our impact at retail. Crazy levels of creativity sure did help. The second saying I finally remember was, one year at Kenner is like seven in the life of a dog. <laughs> I guess that can be taken a few ways, but to me it spoke to the time we all gave to the place, and maybe sometimes to the pressure we felt, because deadlines in the toy business were like none other. Most companies can delay their launch timing if they absolutely need to, but there was no pushing back Christmas. So everyone had to and did whatever it took to make deadlines, and that common goal and the camaraderie around that contributed to making it an amazing place to work. Now, Corky asked me to briefly reflect on some of the girls' toys depicted in the mural, and certainly the first ones to mention, because they are prominently displayed, are Care Bears, or actually more specifically, Cheer Bear, who you can see is patting R2-D2, and Strawberry Shortcake, and her friends Orange Blossom and the Purple Pie Man. Both product lines were huge successes, but what's probably more significant is that they represent the power that licensing had in driving the business. These were joint efforts among American Greetings, MAD, the licensing arm of General Mills at the time, as well as Kenner, as we were the ones who created the amazing lead products at the center of each of these much larger brands. It is easy to forget that before the launch of Care Bears in 1983, there were only generic teddy bears, and certainly we received a lot of pushback from the trade as to whether moms would spend the money we were charging for a branded bear. The Kenner group did an amazing job creating a one-of-a-kind look, down to the cute tushy tag that denoted it was an authentic product. Similarly, Strawberry Shortcake, which was launched before Care Bears in 1979, really created the small doll category. Before her, most girls only played with fashion dolls. Her uniqueness, in addition to her child-friendly and collectible size, was the fact that she smelled like her name, which was the first time a set was embedded into a doll's final head. And of course, each of her friends, like Orange Blossom and Purple Pine Man, also smelled like their names. Another success for Kenner you see here was Little's Pet Shop. This stands out because it was created completely internally. And for those of you who can't spot it, there's a Little's Pet Shop puppy in the passenger side of the Ghostbusters Ecto-1, and there's actually one right by Plato, which I noticed this morning. <laughs> I was lucky enough to be in the initial presentation when Kathy Kavnar, who sadly is no longer with us, told the story of a little girl who goes into a pet shop and laments to the store owner that her mom wouldn't let her have a pet since their apartment was too small, at which point the store owner took the girl to the back room and it was inhabited by a collection of miniature pets. When Kathy demonstrated that the pets she envisioned could be made to do lifelike actions with mechanisms more commonly used in our action figure business, we were all in awe. Who, for, who could forget the dog that magically wagged its tail when it was brushed, thanks to magnets embedded in each, or the bird that magically flapped its wings? Little's Pet Shop also had the appeal that its entry price point was similar to action figures at around $5, so mom could easily buy a pet and not feel much of a pinch in her wallet. It is amazing, reassuring, and incredibly gratifying to see how these brands have endured. There's a very common ebb and flow or life cycle associated with the toy business, but these have all been revived over and over, and they're here because they've withstood the test of time, which, so, for, which for so many toys never happens. The last product I want to mention here is Play-Doh. It's a brand everyone knows, and it has a special place in my heart because it was my first assignment when I came to Kenner from P&G. Plato was launched 60 years ago in 1956 and has been on store shelves ever since. But what's significant, and it goes back to the culture of Kenner, is that one of the memorable parts of working on the line was being able to know Dr. Tin Liu, a Cornell-trained chemist who perfected the Plato formula. He must have been in his late 70s, early 80s when I joined the company. And he still came to work for a couple of hours each day. This was a company that allowed him to do that, and most companies would have required him to retire, which says plenty about this extraordinary place that existed behind the products you see represented today. I know I've said it a few times, but what made Kenner Hasbro so awesome was the people. There was a certain culture to the place that I never experienced again. People genuinely liked one another and put their egos aside for the greater good. 
I had the privilege of being part of the recent Cincinnati Library event, and when I looked out at the crowd, I wish there was a way to recognize all of our colleagues in attendance. So even though Corky's done it once, I'm gonna do it again. If you ever worked at Ken or Hasbro, um, please stand up, and if you're standing, please raise your hand, and thank you, this mural is all about you. My speech, but I thought we were short time. Stay standing and stay, keep your hand up. If you were here five years or less, please sit down. Mentally? If you were here 10 years or less, please sit down. Mentally or 15 years, I'm still standing. 20 years or less, I'm down. So people with their hands up or standing were here for 25 years or more. Thank you so much. And Patty says, you're all right here. Ginger, thank you. Pete Kelly is tall in stature, but his height is unparalleled within the United States toy industry. Pete was the face and the voice for decades of Kenner. He led a sales team from a small family business into a major player in the United States toy industry. Pete learned very early on when a buyer that he approached said, no thank you. He didn't really mean, or she didn't really mean no thank you. It was Pete's job to show him why or her why he really or she meant thank you. Pete <laughs> Kelly. Ginger was uh, talking about how long we've been with Kenner. Uh, I was with Kenner for almost 30 years, and looking out, seeing all my, that was break up, my colleagues here, um, this is an expression of your efforts, your talent, and everything. And I just want to walk you through some of our successes. First, Star Wars. You know, we were just coming off the $6 million man who was shedding a lot of zeros from the sales perspective. Uh -huh. George Lucas came to town. He had been turned down by almost all the major toy companies came to Cincinnati, went to our conference room, hung up a bunch of butcher block papers uh, with designs on them. Walked the people through the room, that's Darth Vader, that's the Millennium Falcon, and that's R2, and we broke. I wasn't part of that meeting, but Bernie and Joe got together and said, we don't know anything about the toy business, but that's a great toy line. Uh, let's give them $25,000 and 5% royalty, and we'll, go, we'll run with it. And that began, uh, began an extraordinary uh, journey. Um, it was uh, unbelievable. The first year we didn't have toys, as you all remember, we had to try to sell a gift certificate while the kids were, uh, were waiting. But then we got uh, really revved up, and one of the things that changed the action figure business was all figures were like G.I. Joe or $6 million man, 12, 13 inches. We came up, and one of our designers were three and three quarter inches, so we could fit all the figures and the vehicles, etc. And it was just an extraordinary success. The market penetration on Star Wars, normally, if you can make 50% penetration of your you know, target audience, you're doing great. Star Wars was 85% in terms of penetration. The average boy owned 11 figures. We sold 20 million figures, you set your watch on it uh, every year. It just really turned the company around, it was an amazing, amazing game changer. And rather than being the last toy company that people like Lucas would visit, we became the first toy company that they came to. It was just an extraordinary success. Uh, Ghostbusters was really the first humor-based uh, category that was ever uh, successful. It was just uh, unbelievable. But our marketing guys were extraordinarily in this event. We said, if we run a commercial and you can't play the real Ghostbusters song, who are you going to call? You don't have a commercial. We played that song. It revved the category up, and ecto-1s and ectoplasms and fire stations uh, just blew off the counter. Uh, mask is really an interesting thing because we were, uh, you can see the, the, the car over there. This was all us. We developed the characters, we developed the toys, we developed the an animation, uh, and we created this thing where illusion is the ultimate weapon, where Camaros turned into jet fighter planes, and motorcycles turned into hang gliders, uh, luxury cars turned into helicopters. It was just an amazing thing, and for the first time, 
we were on the royalty end. We got royalties for notebooks and backpacks and socks and you name it. It was just an extraordinary thing and it was all internally uh, developed. Um, Batman is another story. Um, Batman was not a, a successful license at all. Everybody was held to the standard. You could just do the figure and that blue thing. We convinced, our marketers and designers convinced them, let us do different versions of, of, Bat, of Batman. We ended up doing over 300 versions of Batman, whether it was Deep Dive or uh, Camo Batman or Arctic Batman, it just actually blew the doors off. We became so involved with the studios that our designers were actually working hand in hand with the studios. We were designing the Batmobiles that went into the, into the movies. It was just an extraordinary success. Jurassic Park was the next one, uh, which was great. Uh, one of the elements here was that, you know, every kid has a dinosaur. There were so many generic dinosaurs out there, so we branded the brand. We had it on the haunch, uh, you know, Jurassic Park branch, and our action figures here uh, played a different kind of role. They weren't the hero role, they were really dino food. That was what they did uh, for Jurassic Park. And lastly, Nerf, we inherited Nerf from Parker Brothers. It's a very successful line, about eight SKU stock keeping units, uh, some balls, and the bow and arrow. Our people got involved, we segmented the line, we came up with Pro Nerf, we came up with Sport Nerf, we came up with Action Nerf, uh, we repackaged it, we did a Nerf Center in almost every major retailer where we had 15 linear feet of Nerf products out there, and it became all, uh, we tripled the volume in basically no time. So but that's just a brief walk through the, through the products, and uh, I'm just so happy to see so many colleagues that we shared so many memories with him. Two names I'd like to mention who were really instrumental and part of all the stuff is Joe Mendelson, who couldn't be here today, and Bruce Stein. But uh, they, they deserve a lot of credit and it's good seeing you all. I had the pleasure to work with Pete for a number of years and you just heard a rendition of just a glimpse of what he's capable of doing. I want him to show you today how he presented a product that was not developed, it was not ready to be shown, and how he got that product into the marketplace. He has no idea of what I'm talking about. But at the moment I say this, I am sure that he will regale you with 30 seconds of how to present a non-existing product. And that product was based on what was supposed to be a blockbuster movie called The Alien. He that was not a highlight of our toy fair that year, but we had to present something like this. We had to tell the trade that we can't show you this, it's going to be an unbelievable movie. This design of this thing is going to be unbelievable. You've never seen a monster like this. And I have to tell Com uh, Corky the comment of one of uh, the buyers from Kmart. We got through the presentation and he said, come here. He said, you show me a real toy, I'll give you a real order. So. <laughs> And clearly, Pete is and was the real deal. Now, even though we have been blessed with wonderful skies, uh, I'm not sure how long this blessing is going to go forward. Uh, Tamara, you want to come up and take charge? And just so we all remember, after the presentation, we have a buffet by the bites inside the building right here. Uh, and we would like all of you to stay and be our guests for that, and we plan to have a mini Kenner reunion after that. Tamara, it's all yours.